Old Path and our study through the Old Testament book of Job. Uh, we are going to be in chapters 14 and 15 today, so you can turn there with me. And uh, before we get started on this, uh, a couple of just observations. And uh, primarily, it's it's we're already in round two, if you will, of the back and forth between Job and these men who will give him their, uh, uh, their counsel. I guess they would see it as counsel. Um, but by this time, as I've already mentioned, it's become just really adversarial uh, between these people who are there. I believe that they're all listening because the, it seems as though there's an argument that will be made by one of them that's addressed a little bit later. And uh, maybe that's something that somebody else had said. So it would appear as though they're all there together as they're doing this. But I would say that as, as we look at these chapters here, and it'll become evident what I mean when we start to look through the actual text itself, but there are so many conclusions that are brought up here by the uh, the people, not only Job, but by the also by the uh, the people who are supposed to be giving counsel and comfort to him. That really, if we understand um, what the Scripture teaches about God and His nature and who we are in Him and what we represent to Him, what He represents to us, however we want to try to you know frame that that discussion. There is no way that we could make these kinds of, of broad generalizations, especially when it comes to why God does what he does as they perceive it. The, the New Testament doesn't give us the ability to, uh, to come to these kinds of conclusions. And once again, even as far as the Old Testament is concerned, uh, many of the things that they assume are correct in their assumptions are, are completely incorrect when you compare them to what's in the Old Testament. So there is, if you, if you kind of just take a look at from all the, the different angles that they're coming at with this, there is this understanding as far as they see it, that yes, God is, is watching the things that go on among men, but there are things that they just assume that God does in a punitive sense without any explanation and uh, that somehow he's kind of distant from his creation to some extent. It's the only way that they can come up with the conclusions that they do, whether it's the counselors or Job himself. Uh, they would never be able to do so looking through the Old Testament and especially the New. And what I mean by that, if, if somebody thinks that, that things are done in just a, a purely punitive sense and without any real reason, the Old Testament would show that there may be times of real great calamity that will happen to his people, but it won't be without a reason. And it will be as a response to the fact that they have been in a place of rebellion against him. So why should they expect his favor when they are completely rebellious? But it's in writing there. So anybody uh, uh, in the Old Testament sense would be able to look back at what's happening around them and say, but God had told us that this would be the case. So once the law was given to them, and I should be make sure I'm very careful about that, because God took the time to write down the law, then there was that understanding, and it, it really only pertained to the children of Israel. Uh, the law was not intended for the pagan nations. They would be judged, of course, because they should have a retention and a knowledge of God. It's not that he was unknown. Clearly, that's proven by this. They, they know who God is. And they know some bits of pieces of him, but they uh, assume some things about his nature and character that are just not biblical. But again, we only know that ourselves because we have the Old Testament and we have the New Testament to prove those things. So it, it's pretty easy for us, you know, these these the, all this time later, the 4,000 years later, to look back and just think, how how could they be so presumptuous? And how could they make such, you know, such broad sweeping determinations? And the, the easiest way for me to try to reconcile that is that they don't have anywhere near the kind of knowledge that we do. And not because of ignorance, but just because of revelation and what God has revealed to us about him, about his nature and the interaction with his creation. Because we have this, this time of history and we have the written accounts of those things. So... You know, as we read through these kinds of things, it's again, it, it proves that they're only looking at what can be seen from their perspective. You know, all they can do is take a look around them and they make their assumptions based on what they see and what's right in front of them. So there are, again, things that are said in this that it's like none of us would be able to say that. We may say things like this in frustration, uh, may, might even make some assumptions out of pure ignorance. But if we know what the scripture has to teach about God and his nature, we would never be able to say the kinds of things that are being said here. So, again, remember what we have. 
Job claims his innocence. Not that he's a man who is innocent in the sense that, that there's no sin in his life, but it is that he has acknowledged whatever it may be, and he has sought God for comfort and for a reprieve from the things that have gone on, and yet they still continue to happen. So all of his counselors are watching this, and, and again, their assumption is these things don't happen without a cause. And so the cause must be, and it's not just the three of them, as you're going to see here when we get back to, uh, I think it's Eliphaz who uh, says what he says, um, he's going to pretty much say it's not just the three of us telling you this, but everybody agrees with us. The, the ones who are alive now and really historically, everybody would agree with us. You're the only one who's giving this difference of opinion. So why should we believe your word when we know what we know? And the people before us agree. Now, of course, they're silent. There's no way. They're just assuming that that's the case. And again, they're all wrong um, because all of their assumptions turn out to be incorrect and many of Job's as well. So when God is able to correct the record, then this is when it all comes to knowledge. So as I've said since the very beginning of this, th this is a case study in why we should be incredibly careful if ever someone seeks us out for our counsel. And uh, if, if there's something that, that God would task any of us to come to a person and to, to pray for them or to give them in, in any kind of way uh, encouragement, or even if, if they ask us questions of counsel, that anything that we say, we had better make sure that we have a very, very firm grasp on what we can say with certainty, because it's in God's word and we know these things to be the case. Aside from that, it, we don't want to speculate about things, and, and there may very well be times that things come up and you go, well, it could be this or it could be that, and make sure that we're going to deal with it that way. The Lord will let us know in time. Let's pray through these things, and let me offer comfort and peace to you, and as you work through this and as God reveals these things, then as he reveals, then we'll know. But to, to jump to speculation, as you'll see here, that speculation leads to an awful lot of added grief in the life of Job. And now they're no longer you know, companions as they had been before, but they're just adversaries. And it's a three-on-one kind of a situation. And Job is at the point of incredible frustration, as are they. But you know his frustration is compounded by the fact that it's his misery that is now at question and everything, everybody seems to have an opinion on this and nobody's got it right. So uh, very, very good cautionary tale for any of us, uh, whether it's someone else's life or if there's something that we are going through. The last thing that we ever want to do in a case like that is just point the finger at God as though somehow he's uncaring, uh, that he's somehow not paying attention or some other thing, that he's just dealing with us puni punitively and out of spite None of that is biblical. So what that means is that a person at that point, their concept of who he is and what he does is completely incorrect. And we never want to be in that position. So chapter 14, let's turn there and let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you as we uh, study through your word that you can open our eyes to what we know to be true. And the, the things that are said here as they make their accusations against you or against Job or, or these assumptions that they make about you, uh, Lord, we, we pray that we would never get to that place of, uh, of ever assuming anything, but we would always make sure that our opinion and anything that we believe is based upon what your word reveals and uh, then the leading of your spirit as we seek you out through your word. We ask, Lord, that you would help us to understand these truths and that we would be dependable in your hand when you send us to people that may be in a place of deep trouble or in grief or whatever else. May we have your words to speak wisdom. And we give you all thanks and praise, and, and we ask these things in Jesus' name. All right, so chapter 14, Job is now at the at the point where he's starting to question what happens when, when a person dies, and what's the, what's the final outcome of things? And once again, he's able to ask that question because there's nothing that we know of that he can point to or read and know. So just remember that everything is, is really kind of carried down through through the ages through people. And uh, of course, they're kind of nameless. We have the names of some of them in, in the Old Testament. But by and large, everything that we know um, would have been passed on from person to person. But there's nothing in the way of any kind of writing, certainly not that we know of, that God would have purposed men and tasked them with write these things down. We have that starting in the Old Testament and all the way through the New. 
And then we know because of what Paul says to Timothy that all the scripture, everything that we have in front of us, is given, and it's by the agency of God. And the Holy Spirit is the one who has breathed these things out, moving upon men. So that's the important part that we understand the, the scripture that is in front of us is that we would never get to the place of having to come to assumptions in matters. And so uh, very, very important for us to remember those things. So chapter 14, um, Job, he's, he's continuing at this point. And he starts to speak about life and death and, and what happens afterwards. So he says, man who is born of woman is few in days and full of, uh, filled with trouble. His days are filled with trouble. He comes forth like a flower and fades away. He flees like a shadow and does not continue. And uh, and you, and do you open your eyes on such a one? So now he's asking this of God. This isn't a reply. This is his thinking out loud, if you if you will. But he's also making this an address towards God. Now you'll notice in this, he's talking about the futility of life. And I got to be honest with you, even with everything that I know, I'm now 57, I'll be 58 by the time that this year is over. And uh, all that I can say is that there is a, a futility to life. And the older that a person gets, you just realize almost like where, where um, uh, Solomon had gotten to it, there's nothing really new under the sun. But that's not, for the believer, it's not the, the idea that um, there's a hopelessness to things. And when you read this, it seems like there's just a hopelessness in that futility. You kind of get that from Job. You certainly get it from, from Solomon when you read it. And mine is more of one of those, I'm just not getting any younger, you know? So the things that never used to even be an issue to me as I as the body ages, it's just not able to do things that it used to do before. So going outside and running around and doing all the rest of it, it's just not like it used to be. And so is that a futility? Well, as far as the body is concerned, yeah, but my future is hopeful. So there's a, there's that interesting balance between those things. The older that we get, the more we can understand of the futility of the times. And yet our future is so incredibly hopeful. And it's only hopeful because we know that it's coming based upon what God has already shown us here now. So even in the midst of that, that futility of life, I'm sure every person gets to that place. And the question is, when that idea starts to come in, how long does it take us to temper that by saying, yet God is at the end of all of these things, no matter what it is, whatever I might look at as futile and temporary and fading away. Yeah, but the time is coming when the Lord will have his way in these matters. And then, you know, we'll, we'll come to an understanding of all things. I'll see him face to face and all the corruption of living in this day to day life is gone. So there's a great hopefulness in it. That's the only thing that keeps us from that place of futility. And frankly, I don't know how people who don't know who God is have never come to know him as, as their, their savior, as the one who loves them, as the God who has known them for eternity. How is it they get through the day-to-day -day of life when really there's just nothing that you look at that's good anymore? So the world is really kind of careening from one calamity to the next and falling apart everywhere that we look at. And how does the person living in that world without the knowledge of God, how do they actually ever find any peace or comfort? I, I genuinely don't know. I, I can't imagine living and existing in this world without the knowledge of God and what awaits us. And that, yeah, in this temporary time of these lives, that day will come when we will behold his face and all of this is gone. It's what keeps us from really kind of getting into that place of despair. So he continues on and he asks these questions, kind of rhetorical. And so we'll just start at verse one again, because we're getting to verse four. Uh, man is born of woman and is of few days in full of trouble. And so that's the temporary thing of life. And there's all the difficulty that comes along with just day to day of things. He comes forth like a flower, fades away, that temporary feel. He feels like a shadow. Um, yeah, he, I'm sorry, flees like a shadow and does not continue. And do you open your eyes to such a one and bring me to judgment with yourself? And so he's putting himself in this. Mankind is this way, but for myself personally, I'm just like all the rest of men. And yet somehow Job would look at himself and I've been singled out. And of course, this is these are statements and kind of musings and, and rhetorical questions and yet to, to which he, he knows that there are no answers. But if you notice the way that it's framed, these are, these are questions in the form of almost accusation. But it is still a statement of how it is. So he says this, Who can bring a clean thing out of the unclean 
And that's, again, answers no one. Of course, he knows the answers to these things. So it's not as though, as he looks at this, it's not that I need to learn this lesson, God. I already know these things. And yet, where's the end of it? So he says, verse 5, since his days are determined, speaking of all of mankind, but in a personal sense, this applies to me. Job would say, this applies to me, but it's, it's the state of all man. Since, the, since his days are determined, the number of his months is with you, and you have appointed his limits so that he cannot pass. This is something that God is going to say back to Job, because Job makes some assumptions. And so God will tell him, when I set the limits of the sea, and when I did all this, and I did all of these things, you know, where were you? Because obviously you've got it all figured out. It's a way of kind of just saying, you've made a lot of assumptions. This is going to be something that the imagery is kind of repeated later on at the end when God gives his answer. Because he pretty much just says, you know, if I, I, this is God's way of looking at it at the end. I've been listening to everything that you guys had to say. Job in particular, you know, since you've got it all figured out, where were you when I did all of these things? At the beginning of all things. And so this is where Job is just gulp, you know, that, uh, that uh-oh, what have I done? I've got to now answer for all of these things. This is some of where it is. And so uh, God's answer will have some of the things that Job says here in this, again, somewhat presumption. So he goes on in verse 6, look away from him. I'm sorry, look at verse 5. So his days are determined. The number of his months is with you. You have appointed his limits so that he cannot pass. Look away from him that he may rest till like a hired man, he, he finishes his way. And so this is Job's way of saying, it's just like anybody else. There's the weariness at the end of the day. And why don't you just look the other way for a while so that I can catch my breath? And so let me just like someone else, any other person, let me just get my rest. So this does certainly show that, that uh, whatever it is that has happened to him in the physical sense, we know all the things that were taken from him and that's, none of that's coming back right now. But even the, the physical distress that he's in has not diminished in anything that we can see. So what it, what it is that's caused him this frustration of all of the events from the beginning of when it all started to happen to him that doesn't seem to be any kind of a rest in this. Nothing is, is kind of subsided in the least that we can tell. And it's just as miserable to him now as it has ever been. So... Again, I, I can understand his frustration entirely. And I, I would say even now, as New Testament believers, if everything every day was just nothing but horrible, the only thing I can take away from that, if I can stand at the end of the day and say, God, I am not perfect, and there may be things that I have done that are just not pleasing to you, but everything that I can think of I've acknowledged before you, and even those things that I can't possibly know, I've still entrusted you about them, show me what you would have me to see, and if every single day it just snowballs and it gets worse and worse and worse, the only thing we can take away from that is that I will know at some point why these things are taking place. It is not for me to know right here and right now, but since I can't do anything about it and I know that God doesn't deal with me out of spite and out of doing things in a punitive sense, there has to be a reason why these things, maybe it's just part of being part of a fallen creation the rain falls on the just and the unjust. If that's the case, it's all that we can take away from this. But at the end of the day, do we look at the Lord and say, yeah, but he saved me. This I know. Jesus came and died for my sin, and I have been given the assurance of heaven. Isn't that enough? Does he owe me anything at all? Of course, he doesn't even owe me salvation, yet that's been given to me. So the rest of it between here and there, I don't know where it may lead, but it's not, it's not for me to try to calculate those things. So verse 6, look away from him that he uh, may rest. So him speaking of himself in the third person. Verse 7, for there is hope for a tree if it is cut down that it will sprout again and that its tender shoots will not cease, though its roots may grow old under the earth and its stump may die in the ground, yet the scent of water and it will bud and bring forth branches like a plant. So he understands. This is how, how it works as far as trees are concerned. We know this if we ever try to trim them back. And it's, if you take them all the way to the ground, you better make sure that they're all the way buried or they'll come back up. We see trees that cut all the way down to the stump, and yet they can still come back to life. He's showing this by way of contrast to where he's going next with it. It's that way in nature. 
it's that way with trees it is one of the, the examples that you'll get. There's a, a way that it can always come back to life, but with man it is not so. So he says in verse 10, but man dies and then his, <clears throat> he is laid away. Indeed, he breathes his last and where is he? As water disappears from the sea and the river becomes parched and dries up, so man lies down and does not rise. Till the heavens are no more, they will not awake, nor be roused from their sleep. So this is just a statement of fact. Once a person dies in this physical world, now this is not dealing with the spiritual, because he does he definitely knows that there is life after death, but speaking of the physical body, once it ceases to function, it's not like the tree. It's not going to sprout back, it's not going to come back to life. Even though there's a part of it that's completely dead, the tree, if you will, cut down, the shoots are still going to come back. So there's a, a perpetuation of life. As with man, it is not the case. So again, he's speaking of the very temporal things. Until heaven pass away, I don't care how long, give it as much time as you possibly can give it. Even at the end of time, if a person dies, they're not coming back to life in this physical body. And that's his, that's his summary. And, you know, he's got... At this point, there's 2,000 years since creation, if you believe in a young earth creation, which I do. And so from those 2,000 years, there are people who have been in the grave for a very, very long time, and they have not come back to life. So clearly, from the evidence that he has, no one comes back from this. Now, if you say, yeah, but we know that they're going to raise at the end and all that stuff, that's all New Testament. That's stuff that we get way down the road. He doesn't know any of those things. However, he does know that there is a Redeemer. And when we get to chapter 19, I've hinted at it a few times. I don't want to go to it because we'll see it in, in due course. It won't be long. But he says, I know that my Redeemer lives. And he has a number of different things that he knows about a bodily resurrection. I'm going to see him with my own eyes. And so he knows about these, these attributes of what he calls a Redeemer. And so that at some day he will see a physical resurrection, but it will have a spiritual part of it and not just the temporary of life that he's now addressing. So he goes on in verse 13. Oh, that you would hide me in the grave and that you would conceal me until your wrath has passed. So it's he's back to that. It would be better that I would die and that it would just be something that could pass by me until finally this whole thing is over. And so it says that you would appoint me a set time and then remember me. Let it just be, let it come to a, a conclusion. If man dies, shall he live again? Again, back to the futility of the, the, the temporary part of life. All the days of my hard service, I will wait till my charge, uh, till my change rather comes. And so this is even with that. There's a patience. Eventually this has to come to a close. If I die before, before then, that would be the things he's he's been asking for that all along. But the day will come when all of this, even this temporary misery, it's all going to come to an end. And he sees that. Now, he's almost kind of being poetic about it. At times he would say, just kill me now and get it over with. Now it's that more kind of looking forward. The day's going to come when these things will be over. So there's that emotional kind of up and down that you're seeing him go through. So he says this. If a man dies, will he live again? Because he's, I, I'm starting there again because of what he says in verse 15. All the days of my hard service, I will wait until my change comes. You will call and I will answer you. You will desire the work of your hands. For now you number my steps, but do not watch over my sin. My transgression is sealed up in a bag and you cover my iniquity. It almost seems somewhat contradictory what he says. Verse 15, he starts to talk for that hopefulness. I don't, I don't understand why I can't get some answers now, but the day will come when you will call and I will answer. There's not a fearfulness in this. He's willing to stand before God and give account of these things. But he sees himself as being singled out. And I can't help but think, he must be looking at these guys and say, with all of the things that these guys have said to me, why doesn't God have something to do with these guys? Because they're making all kinds of assumptions and really bad accusations, making some, some horrible statements about Job. It's got to be in the back of Job's mind at some point. It's like, when are these guys going to have to start to pay for their crimes in, in the way of their sin against me? But again, that's my speculation. But he's got to be pretty frustrated with it. But notice what he says. For now you number my steps. It's like, I can't do anything without you taking notice of it. And you don't watch over my sin. Meaning, you don't, you, I, don't, I don't get away from it. It seems like everything that I do, I'm getting punished. And so that 
the, again, the futility. Why is this happening? My transgression is sealed up in a bag. It's like, it's like you've taken them and just put them in a bag and you won't, you won't let them go anywhere else. They, they're all like waiting to be revealed in front of me. And then there's going to be a payment, like he says, and you cover my iniquity. So it's that you, by covering, it's like you're making an announcement of it. You're writing it out. It seems like everything that I could possibly do has been held in a bag and it's like it's being written out one by one and I'm having to give account for it. Again, it's futility, but at the same time, I'm willing to stand before you. I'm willing to have this discussion. However, it seems like everything that I do is being accounted for and it's being kept against me. So again, these are assumptions, but I can, I mean, again, without the written word that's there to know about how God does what he does, it may be very, it may be difficult to put yourself in Job's situation because he can't just thumb to chapter and verse throughout the scriptures and find answers the same way that we could. So it's all going to come full circle. You know, this, this will be seen. So he says, but as mountain, uh, as a mountain falls and crumbles away, and as a rock is moved from its place, as water wears away stones, and as torrents wash away the soil from the earth, so you destroy the hope of man. And that's a pretty hard thing that's being said. It's, again, it goes back to that whole idea of futility. That even nature itself is just eroded, it gets broken down, and it's taken away, and it's not going to be able to function. It's just going to, it's in a state of decay. That he sees, and that's a, it's, a, it's an important thing that he does recognize that. But he says, as you decay and you, you uh, through corrosion and through, through the breakdown of things, so it is also that hope of man gets, gets kind of broken down the same way. You prevail forever against him, and he passes on. You change his countenance and then send him away. That's just it's so sad to read this because you just see him as like, I come before you seeking answers and I'm just turned away. My countenance is broken down or mankind seeking answers. They just walk away with a long face and then they die. So it's just such a, I couldn't say this about God. I don't look at him as the one who breaks my countenance. And if you know about a breaking of a person's countenance, they can be happy one moment and then the next moment they're just broken and they're, there's just anguish and trouble and grief. And it's as though God's the cause of it for some reason that's unknown. These people come to you for, for some kind of comfort and they walk away in grief. It's just the futility of it is so distressing to read. And I am so glad that because of what we know as we read the New Testament, we know that there is no reason why a believer would ever be able to say this. In fact, the idea of the countenance, it's the reverse. For the person who comes to God and is forgiven of sins, they come with the broken countenance because they recognize, read the Beatitudes, the blessed are those who mourn. And so the, all those different things, the first few are those the, the, referring to the person that comes to God in that completely broken state. But this we know as believers, we can come to God in that broken state, but our countenance changes in, immensely when we're able to recognize, though we don't deserve it, God has shown us mercy and grace in his son, and we have the hope of eternity and in heaven spent with him, the one who has redeemed us and loved us. That'll change a person's countenance in the complete opposite way as what we see here with Job. But again, remember, his countenance is broken because of circumstance. And our, ours would be broken in circumstance because we don't have a remedy for sin. It's when God does give us that remedy. We may have difficulties in this life, but what we have awaiting us, it will not only counter whatever we should be going through in this earth, but it gives us a hopeful future. So verse um, 20 says, you prevail forever against him and he passes on. You change his countenance and send him away. His sons come to honor and he does not know it. They are brought low and he does not perceive it. <clears throat> so whatever happens to his, his generations after him, a person who's died has no con uh, concept of those things. They're not present for it and they don't know what's going on. They're few, it's a futile thing. His flesh will be in pain over it and his soul will mourn over it. While he's still alive, he'll consider that once I'm gone, all the things that may be of, of consequence to me will not matter because I won't even be able to see them. So as Job finishes this part, there is just... A real brokenness in him. And so you would see as his counselors are here, this should have been a, a clue to them of, 
you know, maybe we can take a step back and try to sort through what's caused all of this later. But this is a man who's in deep distress. And the idea of just piling on by just continually pointing the finger at him or just badgering him into the point where maybe he'll just give it up and, and actually confess to everything, that seems to be their tact in this whole thing. And it's only making matters worse. So again, let it just be something that you think about when you see it here. You may think that your counsel is correct and right that you're giving to someone, and it may very well be, but it's not about winning an argument. It's about how can I be used to minister to somebody who's in deep, great need. And if there are some things that I'm having to deal with on assumption, I need to back away from the assumption. I, I, I don't want to give any counsel that I can't absolutely prove through God's word or through you know what, what's right there in front of you that you know to be true. So here is the, the reply, and it's so tone deaf. So Eliphaz answered, and he said this, Should a wise man answer with empty knowledge and find himself with, uh, fill himself with the east wind? This is Eliphaz speaking of Job. And he's the one who, as he puts here, should a wise man answer with empty knowledge? That's a, uh, it's an indictment. That it's not saying, Job, you're wise. He says, would a wise man, if a man had wisdom, would he answer as you're answering? So it's now gone to the point of just saying, yeah, I'm hearing everything that you're saying. This is Eliphaz. If I was to paraphrase, I hear everything that you're saying, Job. And you may think that you've got some parts of this figured out and that you're speaking to us as a wise person. But would a wise person say the things that you're saying? So it, they, they're both seeing the same things from exactly opposite ends. And they have totally different conclusions. Should a wise man answer with empty words? So everything or empty knowledge, everything that you said, Job, it's empty, which is a proof that you're not wise. And fill himself with the east wind. Should he reason with unprofitable talk or by speeches with which uh, can be no good? Would a, would a wise person do what you're doing, Job? That's an indictment. Yes, you cast off fear and you restrain prayer before God. This is probably as strong of an, an indictment as you possibly can give him. You have no fear of God in this. And by the result of you doing and saying what you're doing, you're actually beginning to corrupt others. You, as he says here, you restrain prayer from before God. So you're you, not only are you the problem, but now you're throwing out the potential of it really damaging other people who would want to come aside, come alongside and be praying for you and offer comfort because of your, your obstinance and your argumentative, you won't come to grips with these things. You're actually hampering not only yourself, but everyone else. Wow. For your iniquity teaches your mouth, and you choose the tongue of the crafty. So it's your iniquity, you're lying to yourself, and therefore everything that you say is based upon your own deception. You've deceived yourself, and you choose the tongue of the crafty. You're finding ways to try to feign that you're somehow not guilty, craftiness, making it seem like you're the victim here when you're actually you're the one who's done wrong and you just won't avail yourself to, to the, the remedy here. You won't turn to God. You're actually, you're, you're despising him in this, or that's what you say. You've cast off all fear. You have no fear of God. Let me stop on this for just a moment because I know it's a little bit off topic, but I think it is a very important thing. It's an accusation here, but it is a valid one. If there are people who will say and who will do things that are clearly unbiblical, and yet they profess themselves to be teachers or prophets or pastors or whatever else, when you can see the things that they say and the things that they support are so absolute, absolutely clearly un, you know, untrue, or when you see these guys that are in all kinds of different types of sin going along like nothing is a big deal until it's all exposed. And at that point, you look back at them and just go, had you no fear of God when you were doing those things? None whatsoever. I mean, there's no there's no fear in you. So you just kind of cast it aside. You go through it, put up the brave face when everybody's looking. But what's going on behind the scenes is just treachery, scary stuff. So, yeah, it's a it's a good thing for us to pick through the little small minutia of our own lives and say, I don't want to do things in this habitual way. And let's make sure we're careful. It's not like you just fall into some temptation here or there. We're talking about people that do things lifestyle wise while Nobody's watching. And then sooner or later when that stuff gets found out, and I, you know, I don't want to just talk around it. I think of the, the guys that we see from time to time that they have been unfaithful to their wives for years in 
that some of these guys are pastors. And they, it's a it's a serial thing. It's been going on for you know lengths of time, and yet they show up and teach Bible studies like no no big deal. There's no remorse. They haven't changed from those things, and and it's just it's an ongoing problem. So, yeah, it's it is one of those things. You want to look through your own life, and and those things need to get cleaned up for sure. So, um, in verse six, it says, "Your own mouth condemns you, and not I." So Eliphaz is saying, "I don't need to make this obvious. Your own words are what condemn you. You don't need my help in this." So your own lips testify against you. Are you the first man who was ever born? Or were the uh, or were you made before the hills? Have you heard the counsel of God, and do you limit wisdom for yourself? Interestingly enough, this is kind of the same lines that God will end up saying to Job, because there are some things that He makes in the way of assumption. So this just shows that you can have good counsel right alongside of bad. If it is that Job was actually guilty of all the things that that Eliphaz says, he can go ahead back back to this and say. So you talk as a man who has some kind of understanding and wisdom and knowledge that is beyond anybody else who's ever been, as though you've been there from the beginning and know better than all. And that would be the thing. Are you the first man who was ever born? Were you made before the hills? Have you heard the counsel of God or or, uh, do you limit the wisdom to yourself? Isn't that interesting? So this is kind of the same thing because God's going to say, well, where were you when I did all of these things? Clearly, you know, just go ahead and explain it to me the way I did things. You were obviously there. It's almost, it's not really taunting, but it's a way of just saying, hey, you've made a lot of assumptions here, Job. So why don't you explain it to me? It's a way of just making him accountable. So there is a, even though it seems like the heart is not right in this, the way that Eliphaz says the things that he says, there are still elements of truth in this counsel. But it's not offered to him because of a love and a concern for Job, but rather it's like almost extracting uh, a, a, a way of um, it, it trying to get a guilty uh, statement out of him. You know, admit your guilt and it can all go away. So in verse uh, in verse nine, what do you know that we don't know? What do you understand that is not in us? Both the gray haired and the aged are among us, much older than your father. So. This is his way of saying, among the three of us, anyone else who might have come to you or would come to you, or all of those who have gone before us, this is his way of saying, there is you on this side proclaiming your 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 innocence. Then there is the rest of us, not just a bunch of kids, but the age, the people who have been around and the ones who have gone before us. So it's that there's all of us and then there's you, Job. So why should we believe what you're saying? Pretty heavy and indicting kind of a statement. Um it says in verse 11, Are the consolations of God too small from you, for you, and the word spoken gently with you? Can you not receive from us the way that we've intended this to be? Is it something that you just refuse to ever see as we're, as we're offering these things to you? So it's also not, not only that, but they would see their own words as, We offer to you with consolation. If you would just do as we're telling you, then the things that, that are, are plaguing you, God would forgive those things. So he basically says to him, and again, how presumptuous this is. Because he says to him, are the consolations of God too small for you and the words spoken gently with you? Why does your heart carry you away? And uh, what do your do, do your eyes wink at? The, like, what is it that's going on with you that you won't do these things? And what is it that you're that you're concealing? What is it that you're winking at? What is it that you allow to go on again and again, proclaiming your ignorance, and yet there's just kind of that wink and a nod. It's kind of like, yeah, no big deal. So we get the picture here. What is it that you're just holding to yourself and that you won't admit? So it says um, that you turn your spirit against God. So I'm sorry, let me just read verse 11 and 11, 12 and 13. Are the consolations of God too small for you? Is it even like, is it is it something that doesn't matter to you? Is it so small that you don't really care about it? That's what he means by the consolations. Are they too small? And the word spoken gently with you. Why does your heart carry you away? And what do your eyes wink at? That you would, that you turn your spirit against God and let such words go out of your mouth. Now, let's remember Nothing has changed in Job since the beginning, and it was God who gave his testimony, saying, "This is unlo- he's unlike anyone else in the world." And he he hold God holds out Job as being 
the kind of the pinnacle or being the most righteous that there is. And yet, because of the calamity that falls upon him, everybody begins to look at him in a totally different light than what God did. Now, at the, at the time before all of this happened, everybody looked, Job, everything must be good between Job and God, because look at his life, he's blessed. Now that those things are taken away, instantly everybody starts to, everybody, the people that are counseling him, the people that take notice of it say, he must have done something to run afoul of God. And yet God's testimony sta still stands. He has not done the one thing that he was charged that he would do by Satan. If you just start taking away the things that are blessings to him, then he'll curse you because you're no longer providing for him everything that makes his life easy and comfortable. Now those things have been stripped away, and this is what they're reduced to. So his counselors, just in, in wave after wave, and more forcefully as time goes by, are just lacking any kind of compassion. And here is their accusation that you turn your spirit against God and you let such words go out of your mouth. So the, the indictment is everything that you say is an evidence that your spirit, everything about you has rebelled against God. And that's why the things are happening that are happening to you. And it's only made worse by you continuing to plead your ignorance or your, your innocence rather. Just how horrible. Verse 14, what is man that he could be pure? And who is uh, born of a woman that uh, he could be righteous? If God puts no trust in his saints, which is a way of just looking at angels, they're referred to as saints in other places, because he's talking about things other than man. If God will not put his trust or doesn't look at other things of his creation as being, you know, uh, aside from the potential of corruption, how is it that man's going to escape? So, if God puts no trust in his saints and the heavens are not pure in his sight, even the creation itself, all of it is corrupt, then how much less man who is uh, abominable and filthy, who drinks iniquity like water? Now, it's interesting because they make this an indictment against, against Job, but this is really kind of a, almost a self-defeating line of, of argument. Because if Job would say, well, wait a minute, if the angels are, are can't be beyond corruption, and, and even the, the creation that's not even alive, it's not you know a being, it can't be held responsible for sin, if those things are not beyond corruption, and you point the finger at me that I must be as well, what, what does that do for you? So again, it's, it's not that kind of argument, but it's just such a, it's, it's so, um, of his counselors, it is, it's so, again, tone deaf. I can't think of another way of putting it. it the, the, the irony in this is just amazing, as though somehow they're in a different position than he is. It's crazy. Verse 17. So now look at this. It's going to be more presumption and real just straight arrogance. I will tell you, so hear me. When I have seen, I will declare. So once again, this idea that you don't know anything, we know everything, and we're going to educate you. So what he's this whole thing pay attention job because we're going to do this again i'm going to tell you because wisdom would dictate these things what wise men have told everybody in the past oh those of us who is here bill dad uh, so far and, and eliphaz these three guys they're going to tell you right so what wise men have told not hiding anything received from their fathers to whom alone the land was given and no alien passed among them so that's ways of saying for generations, people have believed these things like we're believing and trying to tell you, but you won't listen. So this is, again, that this, just because everybody, or the old saying, might does not make right, um, just because you want to say that everybody agrees with you doesn't mean that you're right. And they may not agree with you at all. Or maybe they do. That still doesn't change the fact that you're wrong. So... To whom alone was given the land, that's given by God. No alien passed among them. They weren't corrupted by things. God saw to them. They took care of them. The wicked man writhes with pain by, by contrast. The wicked man writhes with pain all of his days. And the number of his years is hidden from the oppressor. Dreadful sounds are in his ears and prosperity. Uh, in, in prosperity, the destroyer comes upon him. Now, what he has here, he's beginning the assessment of saying, let me explain to you why everything has happened from the beginning. So he's going to, this is basically uh, Eliphaz's way of saying, I'll explain to you from the beginning of everything that happened to you, what has happened kind of in succession. Because again, 
wise people have been telling us from the beginning not to do what you're doing. Somehow you've offended God. And rather than stopping for a moment in repentance and turning back towards him, acknowledging these things so that he would relent from his his uh, torment of you, instead you run headlong trying to proclaim your innocence, and it's just making matters worse. So I'm going to speak to you, and you need to listen. That's how he started this whole thing. Just the arrogance of this is amazing. And he feels some kind of a, of a justification in how he handles this by the way that he says, and everybody else agrees with me. So he says, The wicked man writhes in pain all of his days, and the number of his years is hidden from the oppressor. Dreadful sounds are in his ears, and in prosperity the destroyer comes upon him. That's what happened at the very beginning, right? He does not believe that the um, he does he does not believe that he will return from darkness, for a sword is waiting for him. This is why you're so afraid, Job. You don't want to leave from where you're at because you know that you're going to have to fess up for this whole thing. There's going to be a consequence beyond just your temporary problems that are going on. There's something deeper here. Now it says, um, he wanders about for bread saying, where is it? He knows that the day of darkness is ready for his hand or at his hand. So you, you, since you won't turn to God in this thing, now you just, you fear the end. You say one thing, it's what you hope for. And yet you're really afraid of the whole thing because at the end of it, there's going to have to be judgment beyond just the physical things. There's going to have to be something greater. Trouble and anguish make him afraid. And so this is, again, the assessment of, of Eliphaz, certainly Bildad. So far, they're going to be all the same thing. This is their, their look. Trouble and anguish make him afraid. They overpower him like a king ready for battle. He stretches out his hand against God, not to him, but against God, and acts defiantly against the Almighty, running stubbornly against him with his strong embossed shield. Um, a way of just saying, basically, he's ready for war, and he's going to go running right at the Lord as though he's somehow going to make war against him. And there is a time when man's arrogance is going to cause such a crazy thing. You're going to see it when Jesus returns at chapter 19, and once again at the end of the thousand years in chapter 20 of the book of Revelation. So man will be defiant. They have been so all along, but they're no different than the first who ever became defiant, that being Satan himself. So this assessment may very well speak of other people. It just doesn't apply to Job. So they assume that it applies to Job because, again, all that they can go by is what they see. They don't believe a word of what Job says. In fact, not only do they not believe it, they mock it and ridicule it because they're saying, we aren't buying what you're selling, Job, and you keep trying to sell it to us. That's why it seems to be getting more and more adversarial. And on the same side, Job is at the point now of like, why are you guys even here? My paraphrase. It's like, you if you want to demonstrate real wisdom, then don't say anything and you'll prove that you're wise. He's going to get to the, in the next chapter where he just goes, you guys are useless. It's basically a way of saying, you're horrible at your job. You know, you're supposed to be here to offer counsel and comfort and you can't do any of those things. You've made matters worse. So he's basically going to get to that point. It's become that adversarial. Verse 27. Though he, um, though he has covered his face uh, with his fatness and made his waist heavy with fat, means he's lived in, in a way of, of excess, in a, in a way of, of having, even if it's not excess, there's nothing that is in a way of want. There is, fatness is a way of saying everything that a person could have they, they, or want, they have. So all those things are there. He dwells in, though he has all these things, yet he dwells in desolate cities and houses where, uh, where there are no inhabitants, which are destined to become ruins. So you may have all the things on the outward, but it's all empty ultimately. So it's just a way of, again, the futility of things. A person may have all kinds of material things, yet there's nothing of any substance beyond the material. So here's what they're seeing. All the material things have stripped away, all of your fatness and everything and everything that you had, it's all been stripped away. Now you're just desolate because that was what always was there. Everything else was a facade. Verse um, 29, he will not be rich, nor will his wealth continue, nor will his possessions overspread the earth. He will not depart from darkness. The flame will dry out his branches and by the breath of his mouth, he will go away. Let him not trust in futile things, deceiving himself. 
for futility will be his reward. It will be accomplished before his time, and his branches will not uh, be green. So this is just in summary, that kind of thing of it's all going to come to to naught. Everything that you do by all of your accusations, Job, that you're making, and all of your defenses and your innocence of your proclaiming, all that stuff, it's just going to vanish away. Everything that you said is going to come to nothing. And so he, he finishes the chapter with these kinds of words. Uh, he will shake off uh, the unripe grapes like a vine and cast off his blossoms like an olive tree. Everything's going to be uh, stripped away. For the company of hypocrites will be barren. Um, this is the way of saying not just you, Job, but all those who are like you. The company, that's why the idea of you're just one of many. Now notice this is by contrast. They've said we are one of many and we're the ones speaking wisdom and knowledge and truth. And, you know, whether you want to take it or not, this is what's right and accurate. Now, Job, the people like you, you and the people like you, this is what awaits them. Um, the company of hypocrites will be barren. There won't be anything left. And that really does fit with what he's been saying basically since verse 27. All of these things will all be stripped away, and they've seen it in real time. This is his basically way of saying it, it's, it's moved from a place of just saying, let's try to reason through this. Job, we already know what the problem is. Now, here's going to be the outcome. You are going to be destroyed. Not just in the physical sense, but everything awaits you is just wrath and it's... You're just judgment. So, for the company of hypocrites will be barren, and fire will consume the tent, the tents of bribery of those people who look to try to to make payment or or some way, uh, try to to find a way to get around what ultimately awaits them. They conceive trouble and they bring forth futility. As they look at Job, they say, "You're this guy." All of these things we've been saying about them. Because all of what we see is the outward appearance of things. It's because all of these things are in you. So basically the company of hypocrites, you're, you're, a, you're a hypocrite like all the other people. No wonder everything is barren. I'm just kind of paraphrasing or trying to reason through this. Um, here's the thing. Fire is going to consume you and everyone like you who just deal with bribery. There's no, there, there's no reason with you. It's something that you're always trying to find a way out by bribery or by, you know, some way of trying to purchase that which doesn't belong to you. So they conceive trouble and they bring forth futility. So the, the, the conceiving, everything that they think about is ultimately to bring about trouble. And the only thing that it ends up giving is futility. So if we can look at this, whether it's Job's statements or their statements, Futility ultimately is the, the reason of it, or the, the end result, I guess you could say, of it. As they look at Job, he's the cause of his futility. When they look at Job, they say, because you're following the course that you are, no wonder everything that you have is futile. No wonder everything has been taken away, and their womb prepares deceit. So they're, they're birthing their own, their own calamity because they are deceitful people. So again, this is an indictment. And uh, as you've uh, noticed, probably as you've been reading through this, it becomes more forceful every time that there is an exchange and a change of person speaking. It just continues to escalate. So once again, how many times can you repeat yourself and say the same thing over and over and not have it just completely continue piling on? And it's, it, it's that point of diminishing returns. It's only going to make matters worse the more that you try to, like I say, badger or insult or bring to a place where you're trying to extract from them somehow a, a, a confession. And that's what this seems like. It's an interrogation. I've been saying that for the last few weeks. And it really doesn't relent for a little while. There's still a long ways to go in this, sadly, because uh, it's going to go on for quite a while more. But again, the, the, the more that we get to unique or the, 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 when we start to get to the places where it is absolutely repetitive and doesn't introduce something new, those we can kind of go through. Um, but it just doesn't seem right to kind of rush our way through this. It, it's pretty important stuff because it's instructive to us. Remember, we're reading a historical account about a, an era of history in the, in the history of man, I guess you could say, because it's before the law. Um, and the only thing we can take from it is the, the application of how do we take what we're hearing, what we're reading, the arguments that go on both sides, knowing the end of this. And how do we not fall into the same missteps that they did? 
and really that's ultimately this. Don't presume things that you can't fully know. Um, you're just going to find yourself assuming things that cannot be supported and we will only create more misery than what might already be there. We want to stay with God's word and stay away from speculation, stay away from opinion, and stay stay uh, strictly with what the scripture provides for us in our counsel. So we'll pick up uh, next week at, um, again, they're going to, Job's going to uh, get a chance to reply to these things and there'll be some more back and forth. And then as we work through the book, finally God is able to answer these things. So uh, if you have any questions on anything that's been covered, then uh, contact me through the ministry website, which is oldpaththeology.net. And uh, in that is an email form. And uh, you can send that with any of your questions and they will be answered. So um, until next week, we'll pick up at the next chapter here in Job and uh, chapter 16 and uh, see what else happens in this. Until then, I pray that God blesses you as you spend this time in his word and as he reveals himself in your life. Mm -hmm.